Chapter 4 We were having a party at our house in Canarsie one Saturday night in April of 1972 when the phone rang. Lydia picked it up and then called out to me. It's some guy who wants to talk to you about your ad. I was half in the bag from drinking Matthias wine and smoking some pot, but I took the phone from her. Hello, this is Gene Simmons, and I read your ad and I'd like to ask you a few questions, this guy said. He had a deep voice and enunciated each word like he was a teacher talking to a student. Uh, sure, shoot, I said. To be honest, I wasn't expecting much from this call. I had gotten a few responses to the ad and gone on a few auditions. In the village and one in Yonkers, but they were all really bad bands. How tall are you? Jean asked. I'm 5 foot 10. Are you fat? No, I'm nice and skinny. I was a fucking toothpick. I was a starving musician. Do you have long hair? Yeah, it's down to my tits, I said. Would you consider yourself handsome, good, looking, or cute? Now it was a multiple, choice test. This was getting ridiculous. So I turned to my friends in the apartment, who had been listening to my answers. Am I good, looking? I asked them. Fucking A, they shouted. I'm fucking gorgeous, I said. I had to give it to this guy. He was meticulous in his line of questioning, and he seemed to know exactly what he wanted from our conversation. Would you be willing to dress in drag? Would I be willing to dress in drag? I repeated the question for my audience. Absolutely. I have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, I'll play naked. I have a nine, inch dick. Everyone in the room cracked up. There was silence on the other end of the line. Uh, okay, Gene finally said. He told me that he liked that I would be willing to do anything to make it, because he felt the same way. We talked for a long time and during the course of the conversation, he told me that he had a band with his friend Paul named Wicked Lester. They'd just done some recording and had a deal for the album, but it didn't come out, they didn't like the guys in the band, and they were looking to regroup. Somehow he made all this sound very positive. When he told me that his producer was Ron Johnson, I got intrigued. Ron Johnson was the engineer on my Chelsea album. And when? He asked if I could come meet him and Paul at Electric Lady Studios in the village, where they had recorded, I was floored. That was the studio Hendrix had owned. Now I really wanted to meet this guy who had been asking me all these ridiculous questions on the phone. A few days later I put on my black, and, gold velvet jacket, along with gold satin pants, an emerald, green ruffled shirt, and green, and, burgundy suede shoes I had picked up in Spain. My hair was teased up in an afro. I was the shit. I took the train to the village with my brother, Joey, who came along for moral support. We got to 8th Street a little early, so we stopped into Shakespeare's for a few beers. Then I left Joey at the bar and walked over to Electric Lady. As I was about to go in, I looked over my shoulder and saw two guys leaning on a car. They were really nondescript both of them had long hair and were wearing flowered hippie paisley shirts and jeans. They were staring at me as I rang the bell and went down the stairs to the studio. I went up to the receptionist. Is there a Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley here? Yeah, they're waiting right outside, she said. I went back outside, and sure enough, they were the two guys leaning against the car. Immediately I thought, this fucking guy put me through the ringer about looking cool. These guys look like two fucking hippie panhandlers. When they saw me approach them, they lit up. They told me later that they thought I was someone famous going in to record. As far as Paul was concerned, I was hired on the spot. He didn't have to hear me play, he was so impressed by the way I looked. 
We made our introductions and went back in to hear their music. I couldn't believe I was in Hendrix's studio. It still had the curved walls, that alien, spaceship feel to it. We went into one of the rooms and there was Ron Johnson, my old engineer from my Chelsea days. Wow, Peter, what are you doing here, he said. We gave each other a hug and I told him I was being considered for Wicked Lester. You don't even have to audition him, Ron told Jean and Paul. This is your guy. He's the shit. They seem to like the sound of that. Ron put on their tape. Almost anything sounds good on studio monitors, but this really was good. It wasn't the type of music that I loved or played. It was a little too heavy for my taste. They obviously were into Zeppelin. But I knew I could cut it, and I thought that I could change the songs around in a way that they'd go for. I heard potential, something in this music I could sink my teeth into. I suggested that Jean and Paul come see me play that weekend at the King's Lounge. With their long hair and their jeans they stood out like sore thumbs in that joint. Everybody had their five, hundred, dollar suits on with their short hair and diamond pinky rings. I was the only guy with long hair except for these two Jewish guys. Who were trying to look inconspicuous. Before I went on, the owner, Vinny, came over to me. Who are those two fucking fruits in the flowered shirt sitting in the back? You know them? Yeah, they came down to audition me, I said. Audition what? You should be auditioning them. You want us to take them in the back and slap them around a little? Tell them you got the job? No. Don't do that. I want this job, I said. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. We love you in this place, Peter. You bring these fruits down, we don't know. It was time to go on. I got on the stage and then Joey and the other guys came on. Three two hundred and fifty, pound half, bald guys just standing there like lummoxes, and I was in the back dressed like a star, thrashing and smashing the shit out of my drums. The whole place was watching me steal the show. When we launched into Wilson Pickett's Knock on Wood, I opened my mouth and began to sing and Paul later told me he leaned over to Gene and said, that's it, that's our drummer. Gene liked the savage way I'd beat those drums. He loved the aggressive vibe I gave off. They wanted a real animal on the drums, and I was their boy. But first we had to play together. We set up a date to play and I went over to this loft they had on 20, 3rd Street. I had to play on their other drummer's set and I felt like I couldn't kick ass they weren't my skins. At that point I had this childish notion that I could only play on my own drum set. We broke into a song that was a bitch to follow, really hard technically, and I just couldn't get it together. I could see on their faces that they were as let down as I was. I don't think we should let this go, I said. Let me come back and bring my own drums and I know that'll make a world of difference. The next time we got together, it was magic. I asked them to play something more rock and rollish, like Chuck Berry, and we broke into strutter and everything fell into place. We all looked at each other and smiled and we just knew we were dynamite together. And they said, you're hired. We started practicing like fiends. We'd get together every night from Monday to Friday for as many hours as we could and practice their songs. I was a little frustrated, since I had original songs that I had written with Chelsea and later with Stan. I was in the same place as a songwriter as they were, but I thought I'd just zip it for a while and do their tunes. I could see that they wanted things their way. Already I could feel a control issue with them. But I thought, okay, Peter, maybe you should back off a little. It's their record. I figured I'd get in that drummer's seat and then I could be a little more forceful. So for maybe the first time in my life, I thought about things rather than just opening opening my big mouth and losing my temper. 
This was an opportunity, and I didn't want to blow it. It wasn't as if they were telling me how to drum. If they had done that, I would have walked immediately. They were happy with the way I changed the songs with my own unique style. At first I gravitated to Paul. He had gone to art school and he had a real artistic sensibility. With Jean everything was so methodical, so cut and dried. We had to do A, B, C, D, E. Jean was a thinker. He'd plot everything out. Sometimes in our business, you didn't have time to think, you just have to jump in. Rock and roll is an attitude, not a science. I could understand why Jean was like that. He had come to this country at an early age from Israel. His mother was a concentration, camp survivor whose husband had left her for another woman. Jean hated his father for that and never spoke to him. He was a big, gawky, shy kid who had been picked on a lot when he was growing up. In Brooklyn. I could see why after all his mother had gone through, and then having his father leave, and then coming to a strange alien culture money and power might be attractive to him. I had more in common with Paul, even if he was six years younger. He had grown up in Manhattan. He had an older sister, so he wasn't an only child like Jean. His father was a hard-working guy who sold furniture. But then he shared a disturbing detail with me. When his family moved to Queens, he told me that even though he was a fat kid, he used to have fantasies that all the other kids would call him King Paul. Bingo. Looks like we had two Machiavellis in training in the band. I liked Gene and Paul at first. They were much more professional than any of the other musicians I had worked with. For one, they weren't drug addicts. Most musicians I knew smoked pot or did a little blow now and then, but these guys were as clean as angels. They were crystal clear about where they were going and how they were going to get there. I felt that I had finally met my soulmates who would travel with me down the road to fame and stardom. It was freezing in that loft in the winter there was no heat so I would buy a bottle of cheap Gallo Sherry and Paul and I would share it. We played so loud that the neighbors were always complaining. The antiques dealer downstairs even claimed we were damaging his delicate pieces with the vibrations. So we went out and got a thousand egg crates and glued them to the walls to soundproof the loft. The problem was there was still egg residue in the crates, so we started attracting huge prehistoric cockroaches. Gene brought up a mattress because sometimes he would crash there, and then he began bringing up women and fucking them on this filthy mattress in this filthy freezing loft with monster cockroaches crawling all over. I guess that was his prerogative. He was also working full, time in an office as a secretary, so he was paying the rent. Working in an office came in handy because Gene could make copies of the bios and press releases that we were starting to send out. The Wicked Lester record deal had gone south, and they didn't have a manager who they really liked. I thought we were going to be the next great power trio. The only problem was we were playing for ourselves in our little loft. We had been practicing and rehearsing for six months, and I was getting itchy. I was older than they were, I had paid a lot more dues, and my musical biological clock was ticking a lot faster. I'd moan and complain that we weren't out playing, we'd fight, and then I'd say, fuck this group. I'm out of here tomorrow. Then the sun would come up and I'd get dressed and go back to rehearsing at the loft. That's how I was quitting. Did I really mean it? No, never. We finally played a showcase for Don Ellis, the head of Epic Records, in November of 1972. We set up a few chairs in the loft, and Don came down with some associates. We didn't really have our look together yet. We wore white face and lipstick, and Jean was wearing some sort of sailor suit. But we cranked that volume up and Don's hair looked like it was waving in the breeze from the sheer magnitude of our sound, like that TV ad for Maxell cassettes. It was so loud you couldn't even make out any chord changes. 
Ellis couldn't wait to get out the door. The only problem was that my brother had just come home on leave in the real Navy and was in his real Navy uniform, standing by the door in the back of the room, drunk as a skunk. As Ellis beat a hasty retreat, my brother proceeded to projectile vomit all over the music mogul's shoes. That was an eye opener for us all. We realized that to get a record deal or even some good gigs, we needed a great lead guitar player. So we put an ad in the voice and went through at least 30 guys. One day, a guy came in straight off the boat. From Italy. He couldn't even talk to us, he was using this woman, who was his wife or maybe his mother, as an interpreter. He didn't even tune his guitar, he just took it out of the case and started playing. We were sitting there watching this fiasco when the next guy came into audition. The first thing I saw about this new guy was that he was wearing two different, colored sneakers, one red, one orange. He had skin-tight pants, tight shirt, long hair, a polka, dot scarf, and he looked Mongolian to me, with real heavy, lidded eyes like John Wayne. A real character. This guy proceeded to take his guitar out of his case and slide over to the amp. We were thinking, what the fuck is this guy going to do? We hadn't talked to him yet, we didn't even know his name, and the other guy was in the middle of his audition. But this new guy just plugged into the amp and wham! He started playing over the other guy. We were all stunned. He just cut the other guy to pieces, he was so good. The first guy packed up his gear and left in tears, so we started to jam with the interloper. He was fantastic. After a while, we stopped and talked. He told us his name was Ace and he was from the Bronx but he really was an alien from a planet named Jandel. I was loving this guy. I'd never talked to anyone like him. He had the balls to literally move a competitor out of the fucking way to play because he knew that guy was a piece of shit and he wasn't. That, to me, was a winning fucking attitude. After he left, the three of us talked. Their main concern was that we couldn't have a Chinese guy in the band. Because we were creating a certain look with our makeup, we felt that all the band members had to be white. Earlier we had auditioned a great guitar player but he was black, so he didn't get hired. But I maintained that Ace wasn't Chinese, he was Mongolian. This is the guy, I said. He's from another fucking planet, he even says he is. But they were still hesitant. I know we're looking for Jimmy Page, but we ain't finding him. This guy's got it, I urged. We talked about Ace for days, and then we finally called him back in. We started jamming, and the sound that was happening was like nothing I'd ever heard in my life. We all knew Ace was the guy. With Ace in the band, we were a lot more balanced. It turned out that he wasn't even Asian, he was of German descent. He was the black sheep of his family, running with a gang in the Bronx called the Ducky Boys. Being from Brooklyn, I didn't know how badass a gang that specialized in using slingshots could be. But at least he had a semblance of being a street kid, and I found that we had a lot in common. He was fun to be with, he had a great sense of humor, and he loved to party. I never met a guy who loved beer as much as Ace did, and he could drink a ton of it. He just loved to get a buzz on and tell jokes in his weird. Hi pitched voice. Maybe all that booze contributed to Ace's offbeat beliefs. He was convinced that extraterrestrials had colonized this planet and he was one of them. In fact, he was working on a radio to communicate with his home planet as least that's what he told us. He believed in ghosts, karma, and lucky numbers that totaled 20, 7. He also had a gigantic ego. Perhaps his belief that he was an alien gift to this planet made him think that he was above doing manual labor, but I just think he was fucking lazy. When we started playing around town, he would come up with any kind of excuse to get around loading out the equipment. He'd move his amp a few feet and then say, 
Curly, I can't work, I sprained my arm. Or, Curly, I have a problem breathing. I feel dizzy. Everyone was Curly to Ace. Most guitar players are prima donnas, they just want to walk up, plug in, and play. But Ace took it to new levels. He wasn't lazy, however, when it came to beating his meat. Every chance he got, he'd jerk off. We would be loading out and Ace would be standing in the corner because it was too cold and he didn't want to hurt his hands. So he kept them warm by pulling out his huge dick and whacking off. One time we were driving away from a gig in our converted milk truck. Paul would stand up behind the wheel and drive. Gene would sit shotgun and ace and I would be in the back with all equipment. We were all shivering in our coats and all of a sudden, we heard the familiar sound of slapping. We looked back and ace was sitting on one of the amps, jerking off. The only time Ace had a legitimate reason not to load the equipment was when we were storing our gear in Gene's mother's basement in Queens. For a time, we kept our equipment there, but Gene's mother wouldn't let Ace and me into the house because we were Gentiles. Maybe it was because. Because we were not only Gentiles, but part German too. She wouldn't even let Paul into the house because he was German Jewish. Rain, snow. Sleet, storm, it didn't matter, we couldn't enter those portals. We had to stand in the cold or the rain and hand the equipment to Jean, who then had to schlep it all downstairs. Ace would always give Jean shit about it, too. Now that we had our full lineup, we had two more things to do, come up with a name and start playing gigs. One night Paul and Jean and I were driving to the loft and trying to come up with a name for the group. We wanted it to be sexual and hard yet also convey the spirit of rock and roll. Let's call the band fuck, I said as a joke. Okay, that was the bottom line. But how do you get to that point? I mentioned that I had been in a band called Lips. Suddenly Paul said, kiss. Get the fuck out of here, I fumed. That's a terrible pansy name. I looked at Jean and the wheel seemed to be turning in his head. He knew me like a book. Well, Peter, there is the kiss of death. Hmm. He had me there with the whole mafia thing. How could a street guy not like the kiss of death? So we started breaking it down. Before you get in her pants, you gotta kiss her. Warm her up to get to second base. Good kissing makes for good laying. It's sexual, it's cool, let's go with it, we thought. When Ace came in a week later with his sketch for a KISS logo, the name was confirmed in heaven. Ace is a great artist, and his KISS rendition, with the last two letters as lightning bolts, was totally bitching. And contrary to some people's opinions, and later the opinion of the government of Germany, the S's didn't symbolize the Nazi SS. Despite the fact that Ace would get drunk and run around in a full SS uniform, complete with a monocle, and scream, You will. Die. Give me your papers. I will kill your family, those were lightning bolts from space. Then Paul refined the logo, made the K a little straighter, and we had a name and a logo. Now it was time to play. At the end of January 1973, we booked ourselves in a little rock club in Queens called Popcorn, the name was later changed to Coventry. Of course we had no following then, so the audience, all four of them, was Lydia, Jean's girlfriend Jan, her friend, and a friend of Aces. But we played our asses off. We played like the place was packed, and afterward I realized that this band was the band. I was so proud of the guys. We were all drenched in sweat, and we had given the performance of our lives for four people. Over the next few months we played a lot at a little club in Amityville on Long Island called The Daisy. We had gotten a few right, UPS, and they were uniformly negative, but we didn't give a shit. I actually liked the fact that we were so obnoxious. 
obnoxious and crazy that people hated us, although it did bug me a little because I thought we were absolutely dynamite. When we first started at the Daisy, we drew a sparse crowd. But for some reason Sid, the owner, kept bringing us back, and by the fourth time we were pulling up to the club in our milk van and there were a few people waiting outside to get in, and inside the place was crowded. We knew we were on the right track. The club itself was a dump, and we changed into our costumes in the owner's office, which was barely bigger than a closet. We hadn't formulated our characters by then, we were just experimenting with different makeup and costumes. I wore a long, sleeved spidery black shirt with studs going down the chest, black studded cutoffs that my mom had sewn, and a scarf. I bought a couple of pairs of light, green hush puppies and brought them home and my mother soaked them in glue and poured silver sparkle over them and they were my stage shoes. The other guys improvised as well, trying to keep to our silver, and, black motif. One night we were about to go on, but before we left the office, I said, let's go out and make believe it's Madison Square Garden and we're going to rock the house, because we're the greatest. I said that because I knew deep in my bones that one day we would play the garden. And that became our mantra. No matter what toilet we were playing, we'd say, let's go out like it's Madison Square Garden. And there was no stopping four guys who had that incredibly positive energy. Gene would jump into the audience and grab people at random and make them clap their hands to the music. That took some major balls. He'd go up to huge, scary, looking guys and force them to clap. I was convinced he was going to get floored one night because what he did was so humiliating. But it never happened. And after every show, I was ecstatic. At the time, we were managing ourselves. When we had a gig coming up, Gene would print up some pamphlets at work and then we would divide up the city and put them up wherever people could see them. We were a band of brothers, all thinking the same way, all pulling in the same direction. What was great about us then was that we were so open-minded. You want to wear nylons? Sure, no problem. You want to put on grease paint? Fine. You're going to wear a dress? Great. Anything we had to do to make it, we all were willing to do. Now we had to work on our images. Androgyny was really big then, with guys like Bowie and even my friend Jerry's band, the New York Dolls. So at first we just dressed in drag and wore women's makeup. That was a disaster. Jean looked like an old drag queen in a blonde wig and lipstick. Ace looked just like Shirley MacLaine. Paul was a little chunky then, so he looked like some hooker working the corner of Bowery and Delancey. I was a skinny little bastard, so I could get away with dressing in women's clothes, but in the end we weren't as cute as the dolls. In fact, we all looked like bad transvestites. That's when we realized that we had to come up with something no one else had. The kiss epiphany happened the night we went to Madison Square Garden to see Alice Cooper play. Alice and his band came on, and Ace and Paul ran all the way to the front of the stage like groupies. Jean and I sat in our chairs in the back, but we were all equally impressed by Alice. It was amazing theater. Alice was in full makeup, and the kids in the audience were freaking out over this guy who came out with a huge snake and got hung on stage. The four of us got together after the concert, and it all started coming to us. We wanted the Beatles wit, the same type of fun paired with a high level of creativity, too. But we wanted to be tougher than the Beatles more like the Stones, but not quite the Stones. We had been battling to be more gangish in a way, a tougher, almost biker don't, fuck, with, us attitude. After that concert, I forgot who said it, but someone said, what if we have four Alice Coopers? Alice was the star attraction and the only one in makeup in his band. But what if the whole band wore makeup, and each guy's makeup expressed some aspect of his persona? 
So Alice inspired us to go from the garish drag makeup the dolls used to more theatrical kabuki, type makeup. Little by little, we'd start bringing shoe polish, white face, and other makeup elements to the rehearsals. Now we were using the makeup to each develop a unique character. Gene loved horror films, so he became the demon, evil incarnate. Polly was always a star, so he had to be the star child. Ace was definitely a space cadet, hence the spaceman. My Catman character came to me one night. I was designing one of my stage costumes at home. I was sketching it out and smoking a joint and then I just kind of zoned out and started staring. At my wife's black cat, who was named Matthias. I realized that we both shared a lot of personality traits. We were both wild, independent, aggressive, powerful yet also soft, gentle, warm, and comforting at the same time. I loved cats. I found them to be the most mystical, mysterious animals on the planet. They either loved you or scratched your eyes out. And like me, they had nine lives. So becoming a cat was a no, brainer for me. I brought the idea back to the guys, and they loved it. By March of 1973 it was time to do a demo tape. Through Jean and Paul's connections we were going to record at Electric Lady, which was really exciting for me, but better still, Eddie Kramer, Hendrix's old producer, was going to be behind the board. That was really heavy for me. He was known for the great sound he got from drums and guitars on his records. I couldn't sleep the night before the sessions, I was so excited to get to work. We recorded three songs in one day, Strutter, Deuce, and a song called Black. Diamond. By the time we were ready to tackle Black Diamond, Eddie had already heard me singing harmonies on the other tracks and I think he dug my raspy voice. Black Diamond was a song Paul wrote, and he sang the first take. Eddie was behind the board listening to the playback and I said, man, I could sing the shit out of that song. Really, he said in his thick British accent. Well, go ahead, mate, go give it a crack. I went into the studio and belted it out. Out on the street for a living. I killed it. Eddie loved it. Why don't we have Peter sing this? This song was made for him, he said. That sounded pretty good, Paul admitted. I put everything I ever had into that song because I had waited so long for that magical moment at Electric Lady. So I finally had a lead vocal all to myself. When I got home that night, I played the demo tape 20, 4 hours a day for weeks, I was so proud of it. I brought it to my mom, who was always my most trusted critic with my music. Baby, this is it. This is your break, she said. This band has it. Everything seemed to be falling into place. We had a hot demo, we were gigging in the region but we needed management to help get us a record deal. By the summer of 1973, I was getting antsy again. I was still playing on the weekends with Infinity, doing covers, and they were getting more gigs than Kiss was. So I started complaining again. I'd been up and down the New York City music roads, and except for Ace, who had once played the Purple Onion, the other guys didn't have any of that experience. We finally lined up a gig for August 10th in the ballroom of the Diplomat Hotel in Manhattan, which, despite being a sleazy shithole, was a very cool place to play. So I was a little placated. The night of the show, Paul and Jean did something really nice for me. They rented a brown stretch. Mercedes limo to take us to the show so I would feel like a star making his entrance. They hoped that would change my mood. Well, it worked for a couple of minutes. But then everybody started loading into the limo. Instead of it just being the four of us, Lydia was in there, and the sound guy was in there, some friends piled in, and then the roadies put some of our equipment in the trunk and squeezed in. Suddenly the limo had become a cab. 
I got furious. We're going to pull up in front of the place and all these people are going to come out of the limo like it's a circus car? That's not cool. But when we got to the hotel entrance, the sidewalk was deserted. There was nobody there to make an entrance for. Jean was promoting this show and had made the wise decision of putting us on in the middle slot, even though the bands that opened and closed were much more popular than we were at the time. A lot of people would leave before. The last band went on to go someplace else, so it was a shrewd move. We were getting ready to go on, and I saw an older guy standing next to my sisters up front near the stage. He was getting ready to leave before we played, but he was intrigued that the girls next to him were wearing homemade kiss tea, shirts, so he struck up a conversation with them and my sister Donna Donna told this guy that we were the most incredible band in the world. So he decided to stay. That gentleman was Bill Ockoin, and he went on to manage us into worldwide superstardom. Of course, we didn't know that Bill was in the audience that night. Gene was relentless in sending out invitations to hundreds of people who were somehow connected to the music industry on the odd chance that one of them might come see us and decide to manage us. That night Bill did come, and after the show he arranged to meet with Gene and Paul later that week. That day. I got a call from Gene while they were in Aukoin's office. This guy is great, he should manage us, Gene said. He could get us a record deal. He's probably just another asshole who's promising to make us rich and famous, I said. No, no, he's not what you think, Gene said. He told me that Aukoin had a music show on TV called Flipside. I remembered seeing John Lennon on that show once, so I thought that maybe this guy just might be legit. In fact, he says that if he can't get us a record deal in six months, he's out of here, Gene said. He urged me to go meet Bill. I drove my Vega into the city a few days later and met Bill at his office. I was in my wise, guy stance, not showing any emotion, but I was really impressed. Bill was incredibly nice, soft, spoken, meticulous, and very, very smart. I left that office knowing that this was it. I didn't let on to the guys, I actually kind of gave them a hard time about it, but I was excited. The following weeks only confirmed what a great decision we had made. Bill was a wonderful person. Unlike most of the people in the music industry, he was sensitive and sentimental. In fact, I had signed our contract with a pen that I had found in the gutter on the way over to his office, and he kept that pen and framed it. As we got to know Bill, we saw that he had an artistic sensibility. He was classy. He dressed immaculately. He really seemed like he was the guy who had the knowledge and the wherewithal to make us famous. Bill's first advice to us was that we should honor our previously made bookings at Coventry in Queens. Then we were instructed not to play anywhere else. He also told us that we were going to play a showcase at the end of the summer for a major player in music who was starting his own record label. That man was Neil Bogues, otherwise known as Neil Bogart. Neil was a Jewish kid from Brooklyn. Who was born to be in show business. He started out as an actor under the name Wayne Roberts, then had a hit record called Bobby as Neil Scott. When his career didn't take off, he became a music executive and became known as the Bubblegum King when he was running Buda Records. Bill had known him for a while and had inside information that Neil was leaving Buda to start his own label, Casablanca, which would be distributed by Warner Brothers. So just weeks after signing with Bill, we were going to audition for Neil at a small dance studio in Midtown. Bill had a partner named Joyce Bioitz, a very cute girl who was constantly bugging Neil to come see us. Four days before the date, Bill and Joyce were hyping the audition, telling us how important it would be to our careers. We got all dressed up as if we were going to play a club and set up our equipment in that little rehearsal room. Bill set up a few chairs for Neil and a couple of people from his label. We turned off all the lights before we began, 
and then we cranked it up and all hell broke loose. They probably heard us over in Jersey. After the first song there was no reaction, so Jean came down off the makeshift stage, walked over to Neil, and grabbed his hands and forced him to clap, just like he'd do at the Daisy. Then during Firehouse, Paul did his usual gimmick. He ran up to Neil with what looked like a bucket of water in an old red fire bucket and threw it in Neil's face. But the bucket contained confetti, not water. And Neil started laughing hysterically. When we finished, Neil seemed to be in total shock. But I noticed that Joyce had her arm around Neil, who was a married man, and they looked pretty chummy. I can't hear myself talk, you guys play so loud, Neil told us. But Joyce was right, you guys are totally different from everyone else. I certainly wasn't expecting this. A few days later, Bill called us into his office. Neil loves the group. He wants you guys to be the first signing on Casablanca. I couldn't wait to get home to tell Lydia and my mother that I had a record deal again. We knew we were on our way. We had two wild men, Bill and Neil behind us, guys who would do anything to break an act. Guys who didn't think out of the box, they fucking smashed the box to smithereens. But what we didn't know, and what would have blown Jean and Paul's oh, so, straight minds, was that our futures were now in the hands of two men who, in a few years time, would both become major coke addicts. <laughs>